Let me introduce you uh, to Reverend Dr. Christian Preuss. Uh, he is the son of Pastor Rolf Preuss and Dorothy. And also, uh, some of you may know him because he is the, pa uh, he's the brother to Pastor Mark Preuss, who is our campus pastor at St. Andrews. Uh, he holds a PhD in classics uh, from the University of Iowa. And he also has his Master of Divinity degree from Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne. He is known in this case, <clears throat> and, the, and the reason he's here, is because he's known for translating Philip Melanchthon's uh, Loki Communis of 1521, which is one of the early uh, Lutheran doctrinal texts, systematic theologies. Okay? So he will be speaking to us about Philip Melanchthon. He currently serves as the pastor of Mount Hope Lutheran Church, and he's also there, of course, with the Mount Hope Lutheran School in Casper. His wife's name is Lisa, and they have uh, six children, David, Christine, Abraham, Martha, Mary, and Isaac. All right, let's welcome Pastor Preuss. I did, yeah. Thank you very much, Pastor Shear. Thank you, uh, our saviors, for this invitation. It's a privilege and an honor to be able to speak to you today about Philip Melanchthon. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. So every biographer of Philip Melanchthon I have ever read has found it obligatory to quote the following quotation from Martin Luther. I, these are Martin Luther's words, I am rough, boisterous, stormy, and altogether warlike. I am born to battle with innumerable monsters and devils. I must remove stumps and stones, cut away thistles and thorns, and clear the wild forests. But Master Philip comes along softly and gently, sowing and watering with joy according to the gifts which God has abundantly bestowed on him. Of course, no one will deny Luther's description of himself. He was rough and boisterous and ready for war. That doesn't need too much explaining. Luther didn't hold back his words, and his colorful speech against his opponents has led in our times to a website called Lutheran Insulter, on which, with the click of a mouse, you can be insulted by Luther in various and wonderful ways anytime you want. But Luther's description of his colleague and friend Philip Melanchthon as soft and gentle is the kind of caricature that actually does need some explaining. Now, obviously, Luther meant his comment about Philip to be a compliment. Luther adored Melanchthon. And yet to call someone soft and gentle can be read as an insult also. Frankly, I don't think I'd ever want to be described as soft. Maybe gentle, but not soft. And the fact is that Melanchthon became, especially after Luther's death in 1546, both the most respected theologian in the world and the most hated theologian in the world precisely because of his perceived softness and compromising. The result is that Melanchthon has become the hero of liberal Lutherans because he was so soft and mild that he changed his view on the bodily presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper, on the bondage of the will, and whether or not to compromise in externals in times of controversy. And the conservatives, while praising Melanchthon's theological contributions and recognizing his genius, decry this same softness and gentleness as the betrayal of the Lutheran Reformation. Melanchthon's softness has been so much the topic of conversation that even the titles of modern biographies can't help commenting on it. One's entitled Melanchthon, the Quiet Reformer. That's this one here, pretty much the standard in the English language, an old one. And the other one is called Melanchthon, Reformer Without Honor. Right? And that says all that needs to be said. But Luther wasn't, of course, comp sorry, wasn't, of course, complimenting Melanchthon's propensities to compromise. Luther would never, ever do that. He hated compromise with all his heart, and he constantly warned Melanchthon against it. His extant letters to Melanchthon, when he feared Melanchthon might be thinking of compromising the faith, 
are bold and forceful in their insistence that he stay true to the word of God. Instead, Luther was praising something he considered to be a virtue in Melanchthon, something for which he genuinely admired him, and that was Melanchthon's ability to speak, to articulate with clarity and conviction exactly what the Bible says on an issue, exactly why the opponents are wrong, softly and gently teaching and convincing without exaggeration or hyperbole or unnecessary, unnecessary insults. In particular, Luther was pointing out the important role that Melanchthon had to play in God's reformation of his church. And that was, as Luther came through, destroying and utter, undercutting the heresy and corruption that had infected the church by preaching the word of God like a lumberjack clears a forest to make a fertile field. As Luther did this necessary but destructive work, Melanchthon was to come after him and bring order to Luther's messy business. Melanchthon's softness, then, was first and foremost a softness not of character, but of speech, and it was his most admirable quality. We'll get later to his softness of character, but for right now, we only want to say nice things about Philip Melanchthon, and so we begin with his youth. Melanchthon is, of course, a weird name, right? It's Greek for black earth. The translation of Philip's German last name, which was Schwarzerd. Melanchthon was the name given him in university, a compliment to his excellence in the Greek language. At first, Philip, who was a genuinely humble and pious young man, didn't accept or use the name Melanchthon, thinking it a bit too snooty. But when everyone but his mother began calling him Melanchthon, he finally gave up and adopted it. His mother never did. She thought it was arrogant and insulting to the family name, and those are her words, the words of a good, conservative mother. It reminds me of my mom, actually. Though it, it has to be said that the practice of Latinizing your name or Greekifying your name, Hellenizing it's called, your name in, in the early Reformation was very common. Right? People would take on new names by translating their name from German to Greek or German to Latin. So Melanchthon wasn't alone in this. So Philip was born in 1497 in Breton, which is a city in southwestern Germany in a middle-class home. His mother was a mayor's daughter, the mayor of Breton, and his father, George, was an armor maker. And not just any armor maker, he was the best, probably the best armor maker in the world. The Holy Roman Emperor, the most powerful emperor in the world, Maximilian I, was once challenged to single combat by a lunatic who thought he was a knight. Weird things like that happened in the Middle Ages. And Maximilian, the most powerful man in the world, because he loved jousting and had a sense of humor, decided to take the madman's challenge. He set the date for the fight sometime off, and immediately he contacted Melanchthon's dad, George. And George made him the best armor that could be made at the time, thin and flexible and strong. And of course, the emperor won his fight against the madman. But Philip's father was so sought after for his excellence in making armor that he would be gone from home quite a bit. And this ended up being the end of him. When Philip was just a boy, his father went on a trip with a few colleagues. They all drank from the same well, and George's three companions died from the bad water immediately. George survived, but he was sick and an invalid for the remainder of his life until he died some four years later, when Philip was 11. His father's last words to him were these, I saw many changes in the affairs of this world, but even greater ones loom for you. I pray that God will guide you in the midst of them. I am warning you ahead of time, son, to fear God and to live a godly life. So what wonderful words for a father to say to his son as he leaves this world. And it shows that Christian faith still lived in the pious souls of men and women even before the Reformation. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Philip's mother couldn't educate the kids by herself, 
and without her husband around, she thought it would be best to send Philip, along with her, his younger brother and his little uncle, away to Latin school in a nearby town called Fort Syme. They lived with a relative, a woman named Elizabeth Reuchlin, who was the sister of the famous or the perhaps infamous Johannes Reuchlin, depending on your perspective. Johannes Reuchlin was the most well-known humanist in southern Germany, an expert at Hebrew who was helping to reinvigorate the study of both Hebrew and Greek and Latin in the universities. His frequent visits to his sister's house were full of joy and instruction for young Philip, and Philip looked up to him as a father figure. In fact, Reuchlin eventually promised Philip in writing that Philip would inherit his massive, rare, and expensive library, and we'll return to Reuchlin in just a little bit. Philip was a prodigy from the start. He mastered Latin so quickly that they sent him off to the university the next year in Heidelberg. There he got his bachelor's in only two years at the age of 14. One year later he declared for his master's degree and he would have gotten it but his professors at Heidelberg refused to give it not because of his lack of ability or scholarship but because they thought he might get beat up if he started teaching so young. That's, seriously, that was the reason. He looked like a kid, because at least physically he was. Imagine a 15-year-old, uh, five-foot-tall college professor. And the universities at that time, by the way, were just as full of rowdy and miscreant young men as they are now. There's actually a play called Students, which was written by one of uh, Philip Melanchthon's students. Uh, that shows how worried parents were to send their kids to university in the 16th century, fearing that they would get into drinking or impregnate some girl or get into brawls and fights or, on the other hand, lose the faith because of some too smart professor. Sounds familiar, huh? In any case, returning to young Philip Melanchthon, he was angry, understandably, at not getting his master's degree he deserved, but the denial of his master's degree was a blessing in disguise. Heidelberg was full of exactly the type of people Melanchthon had nothing to learn from. What Melanchthon wanted to do was study Greek and Latin and Hebrew, to read the Bible in its original languages, to read Homer and Sophocles and Virgil, Plato and Aristotle and Cicero. He wanted to go back to the old sources and rediscover the knowledge that had been lost and covered up by hundreds of years of stale thinking, corruption, and human traditions. And he was excited to do it. He was a young humanist. Nowadays, the word humanist means something like liberal, snooty, pagan. That's not what it meant back then. Humanism was a movement, at least in Germany, that Humanism was a movement that, there we go, at least in Germany, started a generation or so before Melanchthon and was focused on going back to the sources. Ad fontes was their battle cry, to the sources, to the original languages, to start afresh and new and rid the universities of ridiculous speculations and the church from unspeakable corruptions. It did not take a Luther to see that the church was utterly depraved. Popes literally sold bishoprics. They sold them. If you wanted to be a bishop, you paid so much money to the Pope so that he could fund his army, which fought against kings and emperors. They handed down property to their illegitimate sons. Monasteries were filled with sodomy. Instead of urging real piety, like being a decent dad and mom, husband and wife, raising children in the faith and so forth, the priests talked about silly works of pilgrimage and saying rosaries and keeping foolish vows. There was hardly any talk of Jesus, not even as a moral example, and the theologians in the church argued not on the basis of the Bible, but on the basis of their favorite theologians and philosophers. And so when humanism opposed this, it was a very good thing. Luther, in fact, was a humanist. He wanted to go back to the sources, specifically the source of the Bible. So young Philip was a humanist, and he wanted to study those, these great classical works, but his professors at Heidelberg, they weren't at all. They were suspicious of young Philip, and everyone like him. They were adherents of the scholastic tradition. Now, here's another term, scholasticism. It was an intellectual movement that began around 1100 AD, and it lasted till the Reformation. 
It basically coincided with the formation of universities. The reason universities started in the first place is because of this scholastic movement. The scholastics uh, used reason and philosophy, in particular Aristotle, to put all the theology into a logical system. The first to do it was a guy named Peter Lombard, whose enormous work is called The Sentences. As with any other scholastic works, Lombard's is actually quite impressive in its scope and relatively orthodox in its doctrine. If we want to speak crassly about it, he got about 80% right. Not bad. It's like a B minus, right? But the sentences quoted the opinions of the fathers too much and not enough of scripture. It addressed some useless questions and taught justification by works. And these sentences were commented on for over 400 years. Think of that. The same book commented on for 400 years. The sentences are the most commented on book, except for what? The Bible. Isn't that amazing? And until about 10 years ago, the sentences had never been translated into English. Isn't that amazing? So for 400 years, in order to get your doctorate, in order to be a teacher, really, at a university, you had to study the sentences of Peter Lombard and comment on them and lecture on them. That's how popular these things were. And so what ended up happening is you get all of this literature commentary surrounding it. And the more literature you got, the staler it got, the, the, the more ridiculous questions people started to ask. So that at one time they were asking the question, how many angels can dance on the pin of a needle? Right? And so you just had confusion and human tradition plastered over and over and over again every generation. Listen to Melanchthon's assessment of the situation and of scholasticism itself in general in his first speech at the University of Wittenberg. This is what Melanchthon says. Certain men, led either by the wantonness of their natures or by love of argument, fell upon Aristotle, whom, already obscure and rather complex in the Greek, they found translated into bad and mangled Latin, so that he rivaled the raving conjectures of Sybil. Sybil was a prophetess who gave a bunch of nonsensical prophecies. Yet imperceptive men fastened on to this version of Aristotle. Gradually, the better disciplines were neglected, we lost knowledge of Greek, and in general, bad things began to be taught instead of good things. From this state of things proceeded Thomas, Scotus, Durand, Francis, Dominic. These are all either uh, leaders of monasteries or scholastic uh, teachers, a gang more numerous than the, than the descendants of Cadmus. In addition, it came about that not only were the ancients despised in favor of the study of novelties, but in, if any of them survived in that time, they were banished from memory and thus perished so that one wonders whether those authors of sophistries did anything more harmful than that in their insanity they allowed so many thousands of ancient writings to be utterly wasted. To such men was then all at once committed the authority of human and divine law, and from their decrees the children were educated. Melanchthon despised scholasticism with all his heart, and he wanted nothing more than to reform education in Europe and in Germany and that's what he did. On the recommendation of his granduncle, John Reuchlin, he went to the University of Tübingen, where he was much happier, and where, at the age of 17, he earned his, he earned his masters and began teaching. This was in 1514, so that's, to put it in perspective, three years before Luther's 95 Theses. He becomes a, a uh, professor. He soon published, among many other works, a Greek grammar that was wildly popular and used all over Europe. He also, during his tenure at Tübingen, helped to fight against a propaganda war aimed at his relative, John Reuchlin. So Reuchlin, as we said, was a celebrated teacher of Hebrew. Now there was a certain converted Jew, so he's now a Christian. This Jew is a Christian, and he's very much opposed to Judaism. And he was instigating a crusade against both Jews and their writings all over Europe. And so when Reuchlin, whose job it is to study Hebrew, steps in, he speaks up against destroying the Jewish writings. And then he's accused of heretical leanings and aiding the enemy because he sides with the Jews. So the accusation against Reuchlin was baseless. Reuchlin actually insisted that all Jewish writings that impugn the Christian faith, that attack the Christian faith, should be destroyed. 
But his point was that there were many Jewish writings that did nothing but further the study of Hebrew and therefore help the Christian church. So Philip Melanchthon obviously sided with his relative, and he helped compile a book called Letters of Famous Men, which utterly ridiculed the opposing side, making them out to be morons who didn't know the least thing about Hebrew, Jews, Christianity, or how to educate people. The book was a victory for humanism against scholastic traditionalism, and it was a vindication for Reuchlin. But Melanchthon would not stay long in Tübingen. Despite his popularity there and his success, or perhaps because of it, many professors distrusted him, and his being in league with the humanists didn't help his reputation. The old guard of traditional scholasticism weren't interested in any reform in education, and they weren't at all impressed with a boy like Melanchthon acting as if he could teach them how to best educate. The atmosphere was stifling, and so Melanchthon asked his uncle Reuchlin to find him another position. A position at Ingolstadt opened up, which is pretty near Tübingen, but Melanchthon turned it down, knowing he'd have the same problem with scholasticism there. And then in 1518, he was offered the position to teach Greek at Wittenberg. Both Reuchlin and Melanchthon were overjoyed. This was exactly what Melanchthon was looking for. It broke his heart to leave home. Wittenberg had very little in common with Tübingen or Breton, except the same language. Wittenberg had a different prince, different leader, different terrain, it was some 400 miles away, which as you know in that time meant weeks on a horse. Melanchthon would only see his mother and his mother in his motherland a few times more in the next 42 years of his life. Wittenberg was a university like none else. It was founded in 1502, right? 1502, so we're talking just 16 years of existence. It was founded in 1502 by Elector Frederick the Wise, and the elector, wanting to make his university stand out among the others, was also then willing to allow new thought and educational theory. He actually wanted people like Melanchthon. He wanted his university to stand out in contrast to the other universities. In fact, he wanted his university to be the best and the biggest in all Germany, and that's exactly what would happen, in large part because of Philip Melanchthon. Now, obviously, Luther was more famous than Melanchthon, right? That's why everybody knows who Luther is, though they sometimes confuse him with a guy named Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> Everyone knows who Luther is, and very few have ever heard the name of Melanchthon, right? And obviously, Luther then attracted people to the university, and there were other factors at play, too, but the fact remains that within three years, of Melanchthon coming to that university, it had surpassed every university in Germany in numbers, more than doubling its size. Spalatin once reported seeing over 600 students in one of Melanchthon's classes. And others report that thousands, including many who weren't even enrolled in his classes, would attend his lectures at one time. He was given the honorary title Teacher of Germany, and by all accounts, he did more to reform the schools in Germany than anyone else. It was Melanchthon's brainchild to start Latin schools called gymnasia all over Germany to prepare students for university. And this arrangement has remained in Germany till this day. And as the Reformation progressed, it was Melanchthon, not Luther, it was Melanchthon that the elector would send to different cities and universities to reform their educational programs and introduce the Reformation doctrine. The spread of Lutheranism throughout Europe throughout Germany and the Northlands, in its churches and in its schools, could never have taken place without this soft and gentle Philip Melanchthon. And that's what Luther meant when he called Philip soft and gentle. He meant he could talk, he could convince, he could get to the point and explain it so well that it defied, it defied misunderstanding. Luther, not so. How many quotations of Luther's, even now, are utterly misunderstood and used as ammunition against the Lutheran church because Luther spoke unclearly or in jest or in rage or in exaggeration. There's too many to count. And Melanchthon was not that way at all. But that does not mean he was soft in the sense that he was a sissy, right? That's what we mean when we call someone soft. We're calling them a sissy. That's not what Luther meant. When Melanchthon first came to Wittenberg, a mere 21 years old, 
and looking, looking thin and gaunt and pale, five foot tall, Luther was disgusted. He had preferred a different candidate and told the elector he didn't want to Philip. And now that he saw him face to face, he couldn't believe they had made the mistake of bringing such a sickly wimp to Wittenberg. And Luther said as much to Spalatin, the elector's chief advisor. But then Melanchthon spoke. Listen to Luther's letter to Spalatin after hearing this speech. Regarding our Philip Melanchthon, have no doubts. On the fourth day after his arrival, he delivered clearly the most educated, most pure speech. And there was so much favor and admiration from everybody that you don't have to think reasons to commend him to us anymore. We swiftly disabused ourselves of our opinions and notions based on his stature and personality. We rejoice and are amazed at the actual reality of this man. We give our thanks and regards to the illustrious prince and to you as well. Certainly the one from whom we have such enthusiasm ought to be better taken care of. Please give the prince our highest recommendation of him. I clearly desire no other teacher of Greek than this one man. He is worthy of all honor. So far, Luther. One speech, and Luther was convinced, amazed, and thrilled that Philip was their professor of Greek. He went from distrusting the young man to writing the elector and requesting a raise for him. And in fact, Melanchthon did need a raise. He hadn't come to Wittenberg for the money, and the house they gave him was a decrepit mess. Melanchthon, and the same goes for Luther, was unbelievably generous, kind, and pious. Even before he arrived in Wittenberg to take the Greek chair as he passed through Leipzig, he was offered, this is Melanchthon, he was offered twice the salary Wittenberg, that, that Wittenberg offered him to take the Greek chair in Leipzig, and he turned it down. Leipzig, by the way, was a much nicer town than Wittenberg to live in, plus twice the pay, and he turns it down. More than this, Melanchthon would, throughout his career, receive prestigious invitations to universities and king's courts. He was courted by Henry VIII of England and Francis I of France, both of whom begged him to come to them, as well as by universities in England, Denmark, and elsewhere, with ridicu rid ridiculous prestige and huge salaries. And he consistently turned everything down. He had given his word to his prince, and he was committed to the cause of the Reformation. He would not leave his Wittenberg. And his, gener and his generosity was such that despite his low pay, whenever he received money as an honorarium gift, say when Henry VIII sent him a mass of money for dedicating his 1535 Loki to him, Melanchthon gave all this money away to the needy every time. The church would be in no financial distress in our day if we followed Melanchthon's example. And that's not a soft man. And anyone who has read Melanchthon's earlier writings would be a fool to call him weak in mind or conviction either. He spoke at times when he felt it was necessary with more fire than Luther. When Melanchthon, in fact, got his Bachelor of the Bible from the University of Wittenberg and defended his theses in 1519, Luther remarked, they are a bit too bold, but they are certainly true. He defended them in such a way that he seemed to us a veritable wonder, and such he is. Christ willing, he will surpass many Martins and will be a mighty foe against the devil and against the scholastic theology. He knows their tricks, and he also knows the rock, Jesus Christ. When Luther says your writing is bold, it's bold. To return to Melanchthon's arrival in Wittenberg, up to this time, Melanchthon has been interested mainly in language, in Greek, in Latin, and Hebrew, and in literature, the classics of antiquity. His idea of theology was a simple moralism. He wasn't close to being a Lutheran at this time. His theology was like that of Erasmus, who was the leading humanist at the time, the greatest scholar of the ancient Greek and Latin writings. Erasmus also wanted to purify the church, but he didn't want to purify it by teaching the Bible's doctrine of justification by faith alone or by opposing the Pope's divine right to rule over the church. That would upset the status quo too much, and Erasmus was very soft, and by that I mean he was a coward and a compromiser. So Erasmus stuck only to moral questions and wanted a moral reformation of the church. 
stop obvious abuses like priests having concubines and the selling of bishoprics and so forth and frivolous vows. And instead, Erasmus wanted people, the priests, simply to teach basic morality. But in 1518, it sure didn't look like there was too much difference between Luther and Erasmus, at least not to Melanchthon. He respected both men very much. Luther and Erasmus looked like they were on the same side. They both wanted to return to the sources and discover the truth of God's word. They both wanted to reform the universities and the church. Everyone agreed that Luther spoke too harshly. But in 1518, at least, it looked like all the humanists were on the same side. If that weren't so, Melanchthon would never have gone to Wittenberg. But Melanchthon soon learned that to go back to the Bible and confess its teachings was more than Erasmus or most other humanists could handle. It would cost them too much. It was too dangerous. As Melanchthon heard Luther argue and as Melanchthon himself read the Bible more and more, he became convinced that man is saved not by his works, but by faith alone, when he trusts that his sins are forgiven for the sake of Christ, who by his death has made satisfaction for our sins. Melanchthon became convinced that man cannot possibly merit any favor before God by his own works, because everything that proceeds from the human heart is wicked and evil until God bestows faith through his word. And these biblical teachings, which Luther began teaching, in the year Melanchthon arrived in Wittenberg, they convinced Melanchthon. And his, writing, his writings in 1518 are still infected with works righteousness, with this moralism that sounds like Erasmus. But by 1519, Melanchthon is speaking with the, con the full conviction of the Lutheran cause. And Melanchthon put his money where his mouth was. Melanchthon declared himself ready to die for the evangelical cause. Again, he was no softy. And so after Luther's debate with Eck over papal authority, we all know who John Eck is. He's Luther's like greatest enemy in the Reformation. In 1519, Luther had a debate with Eck. Uh, it's called the Leipzig debate. Luther, uh, Luther debated him over papal supremacy, whether the Pope should be the head of the church by divine right. Melanchthon finally got himself involved in a public dispute in, the re in, the, in defense of the Reformation at this time. And at this time, by the way, the printing press had just recently been invented, and it was Luther and Melanchthon who finally put it to good use, so that even letters were routinely published and distributed. If you wrote a letter, you better expect it to be published. So Melanchthon was actually just writing letters about Eck, and Eck was just writing letters about Philip, and these letters were published and read widely. Melanchthon in these letters showed clearly where his allegiance lay, and that was with scripture, and therefore with Luther. Listen to a portion of his letter against Eck. Good God, what a maze of church politics has been manufactured. One man following an opinion on the authority of the papacy, another following a council, but no one consulting holy scripture. In the citadels of scholasticism, one learns theology not according to the Bible, but according to the pronouncements of men. So there you see his, his stress on sola scriptura, only scripture decides. Melanchthon adored Luther because he adored what Luther spoke, and that was the truth of God's word. Melanchthon wished often that Luther would not speak so harshly and in such a way as to simply provoke his enemies. For instance, when in later years Melanchthon was trying to reach an agreement with the southern Germans on the Lord's Supper, Luther insisted that the only way they could have fellowship would be if the South Germans agreed that in the supper we chew Christ's body and rend it with our teeth. Right? So, Melanchthon's trying to compromise with these guys, talk with them, be friendly. And Luther gives them the document and says, they must say this, that we chew it, that we rend it with our teeth. Now, that's not how you win over your adversaries. It made everyone cringe. In fact, it's not even really what Luther believed. It was the type of hyperbolic, in-your-face talk that Luther spoke in order to make his refusal to compromise on God's word known to the world, to make his position clear, and that was that Jesus' body and blood is actually eaten and drunk in the Lord's Supper and not simply bread and wine. But this kind of talk that distressed Melanchthon throughout his life it was exactly the way Luther continued to talk. And even though this was the case, Melanchthon saw that Luther's in-your-face talk 
was part and parcel of the divine gift God had bestowed on him, and that despite his hard words, or maybe because of them, God was bringing the truth of the gospel into the world. So despite their personality conflicts, Melanchthon had very deep respect for Luther. In fact, Melanchthon loved Luther as a father and a brother. There's been some academic debate recently as to whether Luther and Melanchthon were really friends or whether it's better to say they were merely acquaintances and colleagues. And this is complete nonsense. Luther routinely visited Melanchthon's backyard to drink beer and talk theology. That's what friends do. If I drink beer and talk theology routinely with my neighbor, even if we work at the same university and are discussing our students and our work, we're friends. And we're good friends at that. Besides, Luther spoke in unmistakable terms of love and affection about Melanchthon, and also scolded him as only a friend does a friend. And Melanchthon, for his part, consistently said things like the following, and I quote this from Melanchthon, I would rather die than be separated from this man. Nothing worse could happen than to have to do without Martin. This was no mere professional relationship. They loved each other as brothers in Christ, and each respected the God-given virtues of the other. They were a perfect pair that God placed together at the perfect time for the reformation of the church, and their friendship was forged by their mutual commitment to God's word, and all they suffered together for its defense, as well as all the joy they experienced as the gospel again shone in the world. So returning to Melanchthon's controversy with Eck, who remained Luther's fiercest opponent all his life and was the chief instigator against Luther to get him excommunicated by the Pope. Eck actually traveled down to Rome and basically was knocking on the Pope's door saying, please, excommunicate him, excommunicate him. He's bad, bad. Read this, read this, read this. And so he forces the Pope's hand and, Eck, uh, and the Pope eventually excommunicates Luther. So Eck is lambasting Melanchthon as an incompetent grammarian. So he just... He just studies languages and teaches Greek. He has no business talking theology. That's the way Eck is talking about Melanchthon, which really angered Melanchthon. Any young guy, right, who gets talked down to, oh, you're young, right? Or, oh, well, you just studied that, but you're not a theologian like me, right? Uh, it's, it's really just gonna make him mad, and Melanchthon was angry. But Melanchthon continued to defend Luther and Luther's doctrine as the doctrine of the Bible. He even wrote a tract against the theology faculty of Paris, the Sorbonne, who had issued a pathetic statement condemning Luther and siding with Eck. Here's just a snippet of 24-year-old Melanchthon's bold refutation of the most celebrated theological faculty in the world. The gospel has been obscured, faith erased, a teaching of works accepted, and instead of a Christian people, we are a people not even of the law, but of Aristotelian morals. And contrary to every intent of the spirit, Christianity has been turned into a philosophical way of life. So you can see that Melanchthon didn't mince his words. And then in the midst of all this, as Melanchthon has plunged himself into the defense of the gospel, he gets a letter. And it's from Uncle Reuchlin. The man, by the way, you get criticized for calling Reuchlin Uncle Reuchlin because we're not sure if he was actually the grand uncle. That's why I purposely say Uncle Reuchlin, because it makes scholars mad. <laughs> it's from Uncle Reuchlin, the man who was like a father to Melanchthon, who had promised him the inheritance of his library, who had gotten him his, his position at Wittenberg, a letter from Reuchlin asking him to accept a position at Ingolstadt, the very university where Eck was teaching at, and informing Melanchthon that he was staying at Eck's house and that Eck would forgive him everything if only he'd leave Wittenberg, abandon Luther and the Reformation, and come to Ingolstadt. And you can imagine Melanchthon was crushed, his family versus the Bible. It took him weeks to reply. He was a hard thinker, but sometimes he was a very slow thinker, and that can be a good thing. He replied with his characteristic conviction. Many things call me to you, the desire to be near you, love of home, the prospect of association with many learned men, a wonderful library to use, and my health. However, I cannot break my pledged word to the elector, and I do not want to do anything to cause him to doubt my truthfulness. 
I love my native land, certainly, but I must consider what Christ has called me to do more than what I want to do. Trusting in the Holy Spirit, I shall do my work here until the same Spirit calls me away. I ask not to live happily, but to live righteously and Christ-like. Makes you want to cry, huh? Beautiful. That was the last time Roiklin communicated with Philip, the boy he had treated like a son. Roiklin refused to speak with him, fearing that it would lose him his reputation. And so he requested through a mutual acquaintance, not even talking to Philip himself, that Philip never write him again. His priceless library was handed down to the monks of Fortsheim. Melanchthon was completely cut out. And so Melanchthon took comfort in the words of our Savior, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Melanchthon was hired as a professor of Greek at Wittenberg, but Luther insisted that he teach theology also. Melanchthon, at least at first, was more than happy to do so. He taught on Romans in 1520, and his class was so popular that his stu students decided to publish the notes they took in class. <laughs> Punk kids. Melanchthon, who was a perfectionist, was angry and embarrassed that unpolished work had gone out in his name. So he went about polishing it. And in 1521, came out with the first edition of his Loki Communes. Communes. That's this, this book that Pastor Shear showed you earlier. It's a great, great work, condenses the uh, theology of the Reformation. Uh, where am I at? Yeah, so Loki, Loki Communes just means common topics. It means common topics, just the common topics of the Bible. What does the Bible talk about? So Melanchthon saw the book of Romans itself as a digest, a summary of all the Bible, because it presented clearly and orderly the Christian faith, beginning with sin, the inability of man to believe or come to God by his own native powers, the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, justification by grace, by faith alone, the power of the word and the sacraments, and so forth. And this was exactly the theme of Melanchthon's first major theological work, these, these Loki Communes, 1521. He clearly and in order set forth the basics of the Christian faith with power and with conviction. It's a joy to read it, trust me. The world had never seen the like of this book, never. His book was immensely popular. Even the papists, that's the Catholics in Italy, were reading it and, wonder, and wondering at it until they discovered who the author was, and then they ordered it burned. Luther declared it better than anything he himself had written, and he said it was worthy of immortality, those are his words, that it belonged in the canon of scripture. With this work, Melanchthon showed the world what Luther and Wittenberg already knew. He was the clear and articulate voice of the Reformation. And this is no exaggeration. When, Luf when Luther left Wittenberg for Worms in 1521, fully expecting to die at the hands of the Emperor Charles V, or one of the Pope's henchmen, he told Philip he was confident that he could leave Wittenberg in his hands, that Philip would do better than he could anyway. And when Luther was in the Wartburg Castle for a year, he left things in the hands of Philip, calling him his e e Elisha, who had gotten a double portion of the spirit after Elijah was taken to heaven. You remember that biblical story? That's what Elisha asks for, a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And Luther alludes to this when he talks about Philip Melanchthon, right? That you're twice the theologian that I am. But with all that said, Philip at the age of 24 in 1521, and with his great reputation as a humanist and a theologian, was not ready to lead by himself. Not in the controversial times that ensued during Luther's year-long absence from Wittenberg. There were far too many questions left unanswered. A professor at Wittenberg, a man named Andreas Karlstadt, joined by others, 
was insisting on reforms more quickly than the elector or Melanchthon were comfortable with. And while Melanchthon agreed that both the body and the blood should be given to the layman, at this time only the body was given to the layman, not the blood, that priests should marry, that the Lord's Supper should never be privately celebrated by a priest alone and then offered to God for the sins of the living and the dead. That was the common practice. A priest, his job would be, someone would leave in his will, right? I want 50 masses said for, for me so I can get out of purgatory faster, right? And then he'd give like, you know, a thousand bucks to a priest. And that priest would then say 50 masses for him in private, it's by himself. And you can imagine what kind of uh, corruption resulted from that because you had to drink a lot of wine to do 50 masses. Uh, but basically, you're just buying your way out of purgatory. It's amazing. So, but all this was going on in Wittenberg still, right? So they needed reform. And although Luther agreed that all these, or Melanchthon agreed that all these abuses were bad, he saw the destruction that came about in Wittenberg when these reforms were carried out too quickly. You have to bear with people's weaknesses and teach them patiently before you make these kind of changes. But Karlstadt even went further. He stopped wearing his professor's gown and he started dressing like a peasant. He dropped his doctorate, just said, call me brother, not doctor. He encouraged students to smash images in the church and in the graveyard. He called for the abolition of the university itself, insisting that pastors should be uneducated, like the apostles who were fishermen. That one really made Melanchthon mad because he devoted his life to educational reform. And more than this, and remember, this is all when Luther was out of town, a few prophets from Zwickau, a Czech city south of Wittenberg, came to town. And these men claimed visions from God and began preaching in the streets. Everything was chaos in Wittenberg. A leading professor, 15 years Melanchthon Sr., had gone nuts, and the people were either offended or ready to riot. Now, many have blamed Melanchthon for being soft and incompetent at this, this juncture because he didn't take the reins and keep Wittenberg from falling into disarray uh, during Luther's absence. But this is more than unfair to Melanchthon. First, Melanchthon was 24, which, by the way, 24 in uh, the, the, the 1500s is a little older than 24 nowadays, right? They had an average life expectancy of about 37. So uh, 24 was middle-aged. So first, Melanchthon was 24, teaching most of Luther's classes plus his own. So he's got a double workload. He's got a new wife and a new baby. He's got a busy publication output. So 1521 is when he puts out his Loki Communes. And he has to do this to defend the Reformation against its slanderers across Europe. And besides this, with Luther gone away from Wittenberg, Melanchthon was too careful and too considerate a thinker to make the kind of quick decisions a leader needs to make. That was Luther's job, and he was gone. So Melanchthon couldn't be that kind of leader at that time and in that place. Luther did, however, scold Melanchthon for not realizing the obvious and condemning the Zwickau prophets who were preaching in the streets right away. Anyone claiming divine inspiration, Luther said, better have suffered a lot. This is interesting. He doesn't point to scripture. He doesn't say if they agree with scripture. He says they better have suffered a lot, as Jeremiah did and John the Baptist did. And if these Vicko prophets are not suffering, if they have not suffered for the gospel's sake, you can be sure they are not to be believed. More than this, obviously, Luther added, what they say has to agree with scripture. But Melanchthon knew all this before Luther wrote it. He did. He was just thinking it over, writing his friends, getting advice from them. He was a careful thinker, and that's a virtue. It's not a vice. In fact, Melanchthon ended up laughing, literally, when one of the prophets took a nap in his house and then woke up to inform him that he had just talked to John Chrysostom in purgatory. Melanchthon burst out laughing because purgatory doesn't exist, and this Zwickau prophet had taught that purgatory doesn't exist. He'd just forgotten it. Right? So, yeah, apparently he'd forgotten it. So, uh, he, he was clearly a fake. And when Luther came back shortly after, the Zwickau prophets and Karlstadt left Wittenberg hastily and thanked God 
they never returned. Though Karlstadt did, but not to teach, just to get some charity from Luther. Luther returned calm and norm normality to Wittenberg when he came back. But when he told the elector that Melanchthon should now only teach theology classes, Melanchthon had had enough. He strongly objected. He was called to be a Greek professor. He would teach one theology class, but he would not be ordained, and he wouldn't move over to the theology department. Besides all that, Melanchthon said, I need a break. And he did. Melanchthon's regular routine would be to go to bed at 9 after a glass of wine, wake up at 2 in the morning, and work for 18 hours a day. He was a workaholic. Luther constantly told him to rest, and after four years of working night and day at Wittenberg, he finally took Luther's advice. He needed a rest, so he went home, visited his mother and his brother, realizing as he traveled that he was now a celebrity, that wherever he went, people knew him. People wanted his opinion. People wanted him to solve their problems. And so his work followed him wherever he went. But when he came back to Wittenberg, he came back as he wanted to come back, as the Greek professor who taught theology as an extra. And his teaching remained that way basically throughout his life. Melanchthon got a fame he had not asked for. He had been thrust into theological debates he had never intended to enter. What he really wanted was to hole up in his office and read Greek and Latin. But God and Luther and the prince had other plans. So uh, since we recently had the excitement of a total solar eclipse, I thought before, that was amazing, wasn't it? Yeah. Everybody get to see it? I mean, down here, it was it full? No? Okay. Oh, okay. When it covered it, it got dark, the crickets start chirping. It's amazing. The kids didn't know what to do. My wife handed one kid to me and grabbed another because she was scared. <laughs> uh, it's dark in the middle of the day. Anyway, I thought before we start our next section, we could talk a bit about Melanchthon's view on eclipses and omens and astrology. In Casper, Wyoming, pagans came out on Monday dancing, and literally they did, and putting up pictures of their ancestors, seeming to think that something spiritual was happening with this eclipse, that the movement of the sun and the moon was connected with their lives in some mysterious supernatural way. Now we consider this pagan, and it is, but Melanchthon and many intellectuals of his time had a very different view. God was creator, and it made sense to them that God's creation would have a layered consistency, so that what happened in the heavens would predict what would happen on earth. So a solar eclipse always portended something horrible would happen. Any irregularity in the skies, a comet, a conjunction of stars, it made trouble on Earth. So Melanchthon canceled classes if there was an eclipse. In 1560, Melanchthon thought the stars were predicting famine, so he ordered the university to store up food, and they did. Melanchthon had his horoscope read every single day, and one time he lamented that he had let his daughter marry a man who had been born the day Mars and Saturn had met each other in the night sky, because it explained his son-in-law's bad temper, according to Melanchthon. Now, Melanchthon was a genius. There's just no doubt about that. Anyone who has read his three great confessional writings, the Augsburg Confession of 1530, the Apology of the Augsburg Confession of 1531, and the Treatise on the Power and Primacy of the Pope of 1537, Everyone who's read these things, and, and by the way, we should read these. They're amazing writings. They're part of our Lutheran confessions. Our pastors subscribe to these in order to be pastors in the Lutheran church. Anyone who's read these knows that this Melanchthon has a God-given ability to think through theological topics with precision and argue logically and beautifully for the truth of God's word. But we should always remember that both Melanchthon and Luther were men, and they were men of their times. While Luther mocked Melanchthon for his astrology, 
he had some strange opinions of his own. He actually thought that if a pregnant woman would look at a mouse while she was pregnant, right, that her baby would end up also having mousy features. <laughs> Makes sense. But in the meantime, he made fun of Melanchthon for his astrology. So these men were medieval men, and they were on the verge of the modern era. And as far as Melanchthon goes, and this is a wonderful thing, despite his belief in the stars and the eclipses hinting at future events, he still insisted that God revealed his saving will only through his word, only through scripture, and that nothing at all should be trusted, not the stars, not the Zwickau prophets, nothing, not dreams, except for this word of God. So even with his silly belief in astrology, which at that time was not so silly, he kept to scripture as the only source of God's word to us. And that's a wonderful thing. Now, we don't have time to go through all of Melanchthon's life in a year-by-year -year biography, <clears throat> and that might put you to sleep, I'm not sure. We left him before the break in 1524. Now we're going to be hitting just a few more important dates, which will give us the chance to discuss Melanchthon's theological contributions and his more controversial doctrinal stances and his softness, not only in speech, but now also in character. We turn first to June 25, 1530, the date of the presentation of the Augsburg Confession. Emperor Charles V called the Diet of Augsburg in 1530, it's like a political convention, to deal with the division in his empire. Many of the princes of his empire held to the Lutheran faith and had Lutheran churches and Lutheran universities. Many other Many others uh, of these princes had reformed doctrine taught in their churches and promoted at their universities. And the majority still paid allegiance to the Pope. So Emperor Charles V wanted the divisions healed peaceably. He didn't want war. And that wasn't because he was on the fence as to whether Luther and the Reformation were right or not. He was adamantly opposed to Luther. He had declared him an outlaw at Worms in 1521, and he was furious with, Luther, with Luther's prince for not handing him over to be put to death. Luther couldn't even come to the Diet of Augsburg. In fact, the only reason Emperor Charles V hadn't completely squashed the Reformation and kept it from spreading is because he was engaged in war after war against other, more pressing political enemies. Francis I in France, what a wonderful name for the king of the France, right? Francis, yeah, wonderful. Francis I in France was invading his territory. The Pope was making alliances with Francis I, in fact, the Pope had uh, wanted Francis I to be elected Holy Roman Emperor and had opposed, had opposed Charles V. And the Turk, the Muslims, they were attacking uh, Charles V's eastern holdings. So serious were the threats from Francis I and his alliance with Rome that Charles actually had to put the threat of the Turk in the background until he could deal with his Western enemies. So he just let the Turk go against uh, his Eastern territories, which was terrible because they were sacking city after city and they eventually made it all the way to Vienna. Uh, so Charles V captures Francis I in 1525. Then his, and these are all Catholics, by the way. They're all Roman Catholics fighting against each other. He captured Francis I in 1525. His troops sacked Rome in 1527, the first time it had happened in a thousand years. Sacked Rome, and it was the worst sack of Rome. And after Francis again broke a treaty, he warred against him from 1526 to 1530. So Charles is busy. By the time, but the time had come now, in 1530, to address the problem of the Turk. Francis had been defeated, the Pope was now on Charles' side, and the Muslim Turks, led by Suleiman II, were knocking on the door of Vienna. Suleiman was intent, as radical Islamic leaders are wont, to take over the Western world by the force of arms. The emperor didn't want to fight the Lutheran Germans. He wanted them to fight for him against Suleiman and against the Turks. He needed their men. So Charles wanted unity. He especially wanted the Lutheran princes to submit 
But that, of course, was not going to happen. Instead, Melanchthon drafted the confession of these Lutheran princes, and it's called the Augsburg Confession. It consists of 28 articles, the first 21 of which set forth the basic beliefs of Christianity on what God's Word teaches, from God the Trinity, to original sin, to Christ the crucified of God, uh, Son of God, to justification by faith, and so forth. The last seven articles address specific abuses in the Roman Church that the Lutherans required be changed if unity were to come about. This included marriage of priests, the sacrifice of the mass, monastic vows, and papal authority. This Augsburg Confession became the universal confession of the Lutheran Church. Luther viewed it as his own confession. The hearers who first witnessed it, read at Augsburg, stood astounded. Duke William of Bavaria, a Roman Catholic, turned and whispered to John Eck, can we argue against this? Eck's response, by the way, was, not, without, or not with scripture, we need the fathers. <laughs> the Augsburg Confession is a perfect display of the genius of Melanchthon. He says things so clearly and biblically that it's simply embarrassing to disagree with him. Many of our churches in their official charter are named such and such Lutheran Church of the unaltered Augsburg Confession. It is a clear and Catholic, that is a universal statement of the faith that every Christian should be able to agree to. And it's another testament to the genius and clarity of the mind of Philip Melanchthon. But since the Augsburg Confession was viewed also as a political document, it was the confession of princes to their emperor at a political convention, it wasn't only Lutherans who wanted to subscribe to the Augsburg Confession. It was also some of the southwestern Germans, men like Bootser, Capito, and others, with whom Luther publicly disagreed on the Lord's Supper. They believed in a spiritual interpretation of the Lord's Supper, where you re spiritually receive the body and blood of Christ, but you're not actually physically receiving the body, the physical body and blood of Jesus. So this was surprising that they would want to agree and subscribe to the Augsburg Confession. To put it bluntly, as Luther in fact did in his letters to Melanchthon at this time, Luther would never have written a statement that Bootser, Capito, and Musculus could agree to, nor that would have worked as a document that could bring so many sides together to discuss God's word. The fact is that Luther, because of his temperament, was incapable of writing a document like the Augsburg Confession. In fact, when Luther would later write the small called articles, men like Bootser refused to sign, and that was precisely on the issue of the Lord's Supper, because Luther said unequivocally what Scripture teaches. We hold that the bread and wine in the supper are Christ's true body and blood. These are given and received not only by the godly, but also by wicked Christians. And this gets us to one of Melanchthon's weaknesses. It's not a weakness of the Augsburg Confession. It's a weakness of Melanchthon, and that is on the Lord's Supper. The Augsburg Confession itself states the truth about the Lord's Supper. Our churches teach that the body and blood of Christ are truly present and distributed to those who eat the Lord's Supper. They reject those who teach otherwise. This is a perfectly good and true statement. It doesn't say what Luther says that the bread and wine are the body and blood of Christ. It's a con and its condemnation of error is much weaker than it is in other articles, but Melanchthon is still clearly setting forth the Bible's teaching that Jesus' body and blood are actually eaten and drunk in the Lord's Supper by everyone who communes. Melanchthon steps softly here, but he is purposely setting forth the Lutheran position. But later on, in the so-called Variata of 1540, so it's the changed Variata just means changed in Latin. So Melanchthon in 1540 changes the Augsburg Confession. He edits it, okay? Uh, that's why our churches, if they're named churches of the Augsburg Confession, say unaltered Augsburg Confession. We're saying 1530, not 1540, because Melanchthon had no right to change it. So he edited the words of Augsburg Confession 10 on the Lord's Supper, stating now, concerning the Lord's Supper, our churches teach that with bread and wine are truly exhibited the body and blood of Christ to those who eat in the Lord's Supper. Melanchthon meant his edited version of the Augsburg Confession to be a clarification, not a change, but it was an enormous change, and it's hard to believe Melanchthon didn't know that.
That one word with, Melanchthon inserted purposefully to open the door to everyone who denied the actual bodily eating of Christ's body and blood and held only to a spiritual eating of the Lord's Supper. The Southern Germans, together with Calvin, held that the body and blood of Christ were only spiritually received in the Lord's Supper by faith, not orally eaten and drunk. But they could agree that the body and blood of Christ are given spiritually with the bread and wine, which are eaten physically. Do so you see what, they're, what they can't agree to? Yes, I receive, the body and, or I receive the bread and the wine, and with that, I'm not going to say how, but with that, spiritually, I receive Jesus, who is in heaven. Not here. Not in the bread. That's what they mean. That's why they can accept it with, but they will not say, this is Jesus' body. Right? So, they could understand Melanchthon's Augsburg Confession to be saying this, especially when in the Variata of 1540, Melanchthon added that key word, with. And he did it on purpose. John Kelvin, in fact, who vehemently denied that we actually physically eat and drink Christ's physical body and blood, signed the Variata. John Kelvin also claimed in private and in public that Melanchthon agreed with him. Why did Melanchthon do this? Was he compromising? Did he so want unity in the church that he was willing to compromise God's word and the Holy Supper of our Lord? That's the accusation against him, and it's both true and unfair at the same time, I think. Here's my Melanchthon waffling, right? Let me explain. Melanchthon did not know what to believe. He honestly didn't. He didn't think Luther's position was wrong, and he didn't think he could condemn the position of the Southern Germans. He thought it was enough if we merely say that the body of Christ is received with the bread and the wine. And don't try to explain it any further than that. Too much is made here of Melanchthon being a compromiser or a coward. He wasn't soft in that respect. He was soft in not being able to make up his mind and assert with clarity, which is amazing because that is what he was so good at doing, stating things clearly and unmistakably. But in this issue, he was led astray by too much thinking and rationalization. Before the 1530s, he held vehemently to Luther's position, just as vehemently as Luther. He declared he'd rather die than commune with Zwingli and his spiritualistic interpretation of the Supper. And when Bootser declared that he could subscribe to the Augsburg Confession and that Zwingli could agree to it too, Melanchthon completely disagreed, and he wrote a clear and solid statement outlining why Zwingli could never sign the Augsburg Confession, and that the Lutherans believed that Jesus' body was actually present in the bread and wine physically, and that Jesus was perfectly capable of making his body present in several places at the very same time. Melanchthon denied fellowship with Ulrich Zwingli because Zwingli insisted the Lord's Supper was merely a memorial meal, and he unequivocally said that the Augsburg Confession set forth Luther's doctrine of the Lord's Supper. This is in 1530, but Melanchthon changed his view. In 1540, he didn't seem to believe that we need to say unequivocally that the bread and wine are the body and blood of Christ, that the union between the bread and the body was such that in the bread was the body. Instead, he seems to have believed that the most we could say is that when we receive the bread, we are also receiving the body, however that happens. He was wrong. Jesus' words are clear. This is my body. This is my blood. Jesus doesn't say, with this bread I give my body. He says, this bread is my body. So, so that where we see bread, there is the body. And this body is present because of the words of institution. Whether or not the recipient actually believes it or not, it depends on God's power. The point here is that Melanchthon eventually found himself in enough agreement with the Southern Germans to agree, at least privately, with them. But it's not as if he changed his position solely in order to agree with them. That's what compromising is. I'm going to change my position so that we can agree with each other. He simply ended up believing incorrectly. He had agreed with Luther earlier, and he never condemned Luther's position, nor did he think there was any real contradiction. But he, in his later years, spoke of the body with the bread instead of the body being the bread. And this caused all kinds of controversy in the Lutheran church after Luther's death. That's why you never compromise. It just causes controversy. It's funny because people compromise in order to keep controversy away, but it always ends up causing more controversy. Uh, those who are left behind are those who hold to 
the word of God and don't want to compromise because it's the truth. This caused all kind of, kinds of controversy in the Lutheran church after Luther's death as so-called crypto-Calvinists, so secret Calvinists, right? They're Lutherans, but they're really Calvinists, sprouted up everywhere, calling themselves Lutherans and yet putting a spiritual interpretation on the Augsburg Confession's words, just as Melanchthon had welcomed in his edition of 1540. Melanchthon's incertitude in vacillating back and forth on this issue caused great strife and problems in the Lutheran church, which were not resolved until the Formula of Concord was written and subscribed in the Book of Concord of 1580, and it actually still affects us today. To put Melanchthon's view in perspective, Luther himself had at one time, in the Wittenberg Concord of 1536, communed and expressed fellowship with the Southern Germans and signed a document expressing agreement with them on the Lord's Supper. But the Southern Germans sure sound like Lutherans in the Wittenberg Concord. Luther even got them to say that the ungodly eat and drink the body and blood of Christ when they receive the Lord's Supper. But the point is that even Luther was at one time finding that there was agreement between the two sides. The difference was that Luther forced them to compromise with him and not the other way around. The compromise, of course, didn't last. Bootser, as even Melanchthon knew and found out, was a terrible liar and compromiser. You just got to say it how it is. Bootser was a liar. When Bootser gave the Wittenberg Concord to the Swiss, so Bootser's there at the Wittenberg Concord in order to represent the Swiss and his own city, Strasbourg, and he signs this Wittenberg Concord, which is totally Lutheran. It just puts forth a Lutheran view, it says that it's the body and blood of Christ, and that even those who don't have faith receive the body and blood of Christ. So he completely capitulates, and then he comes back and says, hey, we made a compromise with Luther. And they're like, no, we don't believe this. What are you doing, Bootser? Right? But Bootser was just willing to say whatever in order to get peace. Um, Bullinger in Zurich, he was the uh, successor of Zwingli, he called him out for abandoning his, uh, abandoning his position and agreeing with Luther. And so they never came over to the Lutheran and biblical view of the sacrament. Instead, Melanchthon and his followers came over to them as much as they could. And this was probably the saddest legacy that Melanchthon has handed down to us. Now, the next great date and great theological issue is 1535, the year Melanchthon issued his second edition of the Loki Communes, now named Loki Theologici, that is, theological topics. This was an impressive work, four times longer than the Loki Communes of 1521, with more in-depth and biblical treatment of the Articles of Faith, and for the most part, it was uh, an amazing contribution. But the major theological change that Melanchthon made was on the doctrine of the free will. This, again, wasn't a compromise on Melanchthon's part in the sense that he was uh, trying to bend toward Roman Catholic pressure. It was because Melanchthon honestly believed that he had spoken incorrectly in the past about man's will, and he wanted to correct himself here. Whereas in 1521, Melanchthon said that man's will is bound, and as Ephesians 2 teaches clearly, dead in sin and that there is no reason whatsoever in man that man is converted to faith, but it is solely due to the grace of God and the working of the Holy Spirit. Again, Ephesians chapter 2, Melanchthon's position changed in 1535. He wrote, and I quote, There must be some reason in man why Saul is rejected and David received. Luther, again, never condemned Melanchthon for false doctrine here. In fact, he praised his Loki of 1535 and recommended people read it second only to the Bible. Those are his words. Luther apparently thought he could understand Melanchthon's words correctly, that although man is completely passive in conversion, still he cooperates after conversion. And so there is some reason in man why he's rejected if he fails to cooperate. I, I don't know. But in any case, Melanchthon's view led to a terrible controversy in the Lutheran church. Again, the formula of Concord solved the controversy by declaring, according to the scriptures, that man is dead in his trespasses, and therefore as little as a dead man can contribute to coming back to life again, so little can our will contribute in coming to the life of faith. This is clearly what the Bible teaches. Melanchthon, I think, did want to preserve 
this view at the same time as fighting against the notion that man is forced to faith or forced to unbelief. But Melanchthon was thinking too hard again. We cannot explain God's grace. We cannot answer why some are saved, why some believe the gospel and not others, some reject it. We must instead insist with the Bible that God is completely responsible for our conversion and that man is completely guilty for his lack of faith. If we don't think this makes logical sense, too bad. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts and we trust his holy word. We'll find out in heaven. The final time period we want to look at is the time between Luther's death in 1546 and Melanchthon's death in 1560. Luther's death shook Wittenberg and the world. He was the most loved and hated man in all of Europe. He died the pious Christian man he was, reciting John 3.16 over and over again as he commended his soul to the God whose word he had defended and preached all his life. Melanchthon gave a moving oration saying, the charioteer of Israel has gone. Again, referring to Elijah. As in 1521, so in 1546, the circumstances in Wittenberg proved too much for, Wittenberg, or for Melanchthon without Luther. Charles V, with the Turk retreating to the east to deal with Persian attackers, finally had the men to devote to crushing the Lutherans. He attacked the Lutheran lands, and though Elector John Frederick of Saxony fought nobly, he was betrayed by his cousin, Duke Maurice of Saxony, who turned his forces against other Lutherans, and so Charles took Wittenberg. Melanchthon fled into exile with his family. Elector John Frederick was imprisoned. Wittenberg University was closed. But Charles V could not leave a standing army up north in Saxony. He left things in charge of Maurice, and Maurice, who was duplicitous, asked Melanchthon to return and again open the university. Charles V, waiting for the final decree of the Council of Trent against the Lutherans, in the meantime imposed what's called the Augsburg Interim. Interim is in the meantime, right, before, before Trent decides, which required Lutheran priests to confess and practice as Roman Catholics. The Lutherans in the north completely refused, including Melanchthon and Wittenberg. But the Lutherans in the south, where Charles had his troops who opposed the interim, they were killed by the hundreds. Maurice wanted a compromise. And so Melanchthon took part in writing the Leipzig interim, which basically said that the Lutherans would look like the Catholics in external rites and ceremonies, but they would teach Lutheran doctrine. That obviously was a compromise. And many Lutherans recognized it as such, and their anger burned against Melanchthon. Even though the Peace of Augsburg of 1555 made the Leipzig Interim and the Augsburg Interim irrelevant as political documents, the theological ramifications of what Melanchthon had done loomed large. So in 1555, the Peace of Augsburg is declared, whoever's land it is, that's his religion. If you get a Lutheran prince, it's a Lutheran religion in that land. You get a Catholic prince, Catholic religion in that land. Right? That, was the, that was the Peace of Augsburg in 1555, which left Wittenberg to be Lutheran, right? and all the Lutheran cities to be Lutheran. <clears throat> so, could we seriously, these are the questions people are asking, could we seriously, under persecution, make concessions on how we are going to perform our services? Can we seriously pretend that the way we conduct our services has nothing to do with what we teach at our services? When the Pope tells us to lift the body of Christ to heaven, what else will we be teaching our people than that we are sacrificing the body of Christ as the Pope teaches? Matthias Flacius was Melanchthon's most outspoken opponent, and despite his vitriol and his unfair character assassinations, he was completely correct. Doctrine and practice go together. Melanchthon, in wanting to compromise in externals, had compromised the faith, and he had given offense to the church. Melanchthon belonged second in command. He made poor decisions when left alone to lead. 
And to Melanchthon's credit, he never asked to be put in the situation he was. He thought he was preserving Wittenberg from utter destruction. He had to make a quick decision he wasn't prepared to make. He thought he was being faithful to the word of God and making peace in externals. He had discussed doing this very thing back in 1530 with the full approval of his elector after the presentation of the Augsburg Confession. He didn't think he was compromising. He thought he was doing what he needed to do, that all they needed to do was suffer under the interim until things got better. But that's how he described it, suffering under the interim. He never agreed with it. The whole situation now confused him. He wept and he prayed God for wisdom. But in the end, he did not obtain that wisdom before his death in 1560. He died amid controversy, but he died a Lutheran confessor and a Christian man commending his soul to God with the following words. Almighty, eternal, ever-living God of truth, maker of heaven and earth, the creator of men, together with thy eternal beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who was crucified for us and raised from death, and with thy Holy Spirit, ever-living, pure and true, O God of wisdom and goodness, mercy and justice, O Savior, bountiful, righteous and faithful, through whom life and light are given, thou hast said, I do not desire the death of a sinner, but that he be converted and live. And call on me in time of trouble, and I will deliver you. To thee do I confess myself a miserable sinner, burdened with many iniquities, for I have greatly sinned against thy holy commands, and I am heartily sorry that I have offended thee. For the sake of thy dear Son, have mercy on me, forgive me all my sins, and make me righteous through Jesus Christ, my Lord, thy Son, thy eternal image and word, whom thou didst send into the world to be for the world a sacrifice, mediator, redeemer, deliverer, and savior, according to thy wondrous wisdom and mercy, which is past our understanding. It goes on and on like that, but you can see that is the confession of a Lutheran, of a, of a Christian man. God gave the wisdom of confessing the faith in controversy to another man after Melanchthon, whose name was Martin Chemnitz. He was a student of both Luther and Melanchthon, and he shared the best virtues of each. With Luther, he refused to compromise, and he thought quickly and decisively. With Melanchthon, he could articulate and make peace by setting forth the word of God clearly. And as the framer of the Book of Concord, Chemnitz helped finally to bring peace to the controversies raging in the Lutheran Church. And in this, he actually did learn from Melanchthon, even in those areas where Melanchthon was wrong. And he learned even more from the wealth of Melanchthon's writings, especially from the Augsburg Confession, the Apology, the Treatise, and the Loki. And these Loki, Chemnitz actually used as a textbook in his classroom. Melanchthon, Melanchthon's work was continually used. Melanchthon remains a hero of the faith. Heroes aren't perfect. History isn't a fairy tale. Melanchthon, as he himself confessed every day, was a flawed man, a sinner. But God raised him up to guide his church in the most difficult of time and gave him the gifts needed to accomplish the reformation of his church. And so we praise God for Melanchthon's contributions and we close with these words of Luther. I do not praise Philip for he is but a creature of God and nothing. I revere in him the work of my God. Thank you.